Well, we are in the third week of a series called Rebels. We are following the story of a group of 120 people who were labeled rebels, who were labeled outcasts, who were labeled fugitives at one point. And we're following this journey of how they went from scared followers to empowered revolutionaries. And as I read, I encourage you, first of all, to take some time to read through the book of Acts. It is amazing. And what amazes me every time I read through the book of Acts is that God entrusts the greatest message to ever be spoken to you and I. Decisions are made all throughout the book of Acts that have critical ramifications, but yet the people who are making the decisions are ordinary people. Everything that you and I see in the church world today, everything that you and I call Christianity, from the songs that we sing, to the liturgy that we have, to the buildings that are built, to the cathedrals that still uh, pepper our landscape, all of it began in the book of Acts. And what I think is truly amazing is that it was accomplished with and through people that are no more holy, no more sanctified, nor anointed than you or I. And you and I get to be a part of this story. You and I have a part to play in the story that began back in the New Testament church. You and I have an assignment. You and I have a mission. You and I have something important to do. We are not just marking days. We're not just filling time. We're not just waking up every morning and going to sleep every night and accomplishing nothing with our lives. Your life has a purpose. You have an assignment this morning. Are you all awake with me? There is something important God has called you to do. He placed you on this earth at this time for an assignment. Just like he placed the men and the women in the book of Acts and placed upon them an assignment. So we're unpacking what this means. How you and I can truly be revolutionary in our lives. Two weeks ago, We learned about leaning into the miraculous in our lives. How miracles should be the expectation, not the exception in our prayer life. Last week we unpacked this personal revolution that happened in the life of Peter. The holdover that he had of pride. The holdover that he had of prejudice in his heart towards Gentiles. And we see God expanding his grace to all. All nations and all people. So today we're going to talk about another critical decision that takes place in the book of Acts. And as we do, it's amazing how often in our lives the smallest of decisions, the tiniest of choices have the greatest ramifications. About 16 years ago, I had graduated college. And maybe some of you guys in here can, can relate. But I deal with a set of problems. It's called BBP. I suffer from BBP. If you don't know what BBP is, it's beefy bra problems. Problems that guys have beefy brother problems. You know what I'm saying? When, when, you, when you're a large man, you know. You just suffer from problems. You just, there's a, you just live life a different way. Can anybody relate? Can anybody? Come on, somebody not afraid to say, yes, Pastor Mark, I'm with you. Beefy brother problems. No? Y'all skinny in here. Whatever. Richard Porterfield, whatever. Richard Porterfield's like, nope, not me. Not at all. Not one day in my life. Whatever, Richard. Help me out, Bim. <laughs> 16 years ago. My dearest friend invited me to come back to see him graduate because he graduated a year behind me in college. 
So I said, okay, he had just gotten married and was, uh, just got a new apartment with his, with his new bride. And I was, gonna, I was looking for a hotel room. And he said, no, 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 no. You don't need to do that hotel. I'm inviting you to come see me graduate. You can come stay with us. Great, that's good, because I don't have two nickels to rub together. So, okay, it works out perfect for me. So I get there, and he pulls me aside and says, Hey, buddy, I just want to let you know, um, we just got a new couch. Okay? I was going to have you sleep on the couch. Okay? But it's new. All right? And my wife doesn't want you sleeping on the couch. She's afraid you'll flatten the cushions. <laughs> so we made a pallet for you on the floor. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Those things are rated for 20,000 squats on them. And you're worried two days of me sleeping on them is going to flatten the thing. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. Needless to say, I was a little offended. No, Charles, I didn't, but I'm working on it. Thank you, sir. It's a little offended. So I, in that moment, in that moment, it took everything within me not to just look at him and say, you know what? Have fun at your graduation by yourself. I'm going back home. I really wanted to turn around and just go back home. But I slept on the floor and I decided to stay. And at that graduation, um, walking through the foyer of James River Church, Springfield, Missouri, huge church. And I run into a friend of mine whom I had in college, and we lost touch in the years since I graduated. And she was pretty. She had blonde hair and green eyes. And we hugged, and that hug lasted a second or two longer than a friendly hug should last. Oh, yeah. And we exchanged email addresses and phone numbers. And here we are today, four kids later, 15 years of marriage. <laughs> Amen. Come on, somebody. No BBP here, you know what I'm saying? Got the girl. But I can't help but think a simple decision, an innocuous decision. I easily could have turned around and gone back home. No big deal. No harm, no foul. But the smallest of decision changed the trajectory of my life. You see, we're all consumed in our society today with living our best life. You know, when I think about living my best life, I can't help but look at my son Garrett. Like literally just 20 minutes ago, during worship, I'm back over there worshiping, and I turn around and I look, and here comes Garrett. And he's got this big heart balloon in his arm with confetti in it, and he's sipping on an orange dream sickle. Just chilling, man. Just living his best life, you know. Just sitting down like, I'm just, I'm just loving Jesus, sipping on a dream sickle, and I got my heart balloon right here. Life is good. But we get obsessed with living our best life. And I think for so many of us, living our best life equals the accumulation of the best moments or the best stuff. But the Word of God is not concerned with you and I accumulating the best stuff or accumulating the best moments. But the Word of God is, is concerned with equipping you and I to make the best decision in every situation. Because the decisions you make today build your life tomorrow. And making the best decisions does not always equal in getting the best results. But making the best decisions will always equal in living the best life. 
Because sometimes the best decision is not the easiest decision. Sometimes the best decision is not the most rewarding decision. But it's still the decision that needs to be made. So this morning, we're going to look at a situation in the New Testament church to where the apostles, the men who are leading this revolution of grace and faith and salvation, they must make a decision. And this decision, although they don't see it, has timeless ramifications for the New Testament church and to us today. And they make this decision. And it is a moment in church history to where the future of faith literally and figuratively rests on the edge of a knife. But these men are empowered to make the best decision possible. You see, you and I also need to understand that God is not going to make every decision for us. He steers us, he leads us, and he guides us, but he gives the power of decision-making into your hands and my hands. It's called free will. You and I have a choice of whether or not we're going to serve him, and we have the choice of how we are going to serve him. We can honor the word of God and we can follow him or we can skate by and do the bare minimum. But if we follow the word of God, if we follow the example that these men set out, we will be equipped to make the best decision in every situation. In fact, if you look at 2 Corinthians 3.18, it says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed, everybody say transformed, into the image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. God's desire is to move you from glory to glory in this life. And then one day move you from the glory of this life into the glory of the next one. Decisions are the hinges of destiny. And you should never, ever let fear keep you from making the right decision. Because indecision in itself is still a decision. But we cannot move forward if we let fear keep us stuck. See, some of us, some of y'all in this room, you're still dealing with the same stuff that you were dealing with 20 years ago. You're dealing with the same baggage, the same issues, the same personal turmoils that you dealt with when you were in high school. God's wanting to move you past those things. He's wanting to move you into new territories. He's wanting to move you into new glories. But, he, but you and I need to make the decision to follow him. Amen. Acts chapter 15 says this. Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised, According to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. Let me unpack this a little bit and put it into context. What we have going on right now is this newly formed New Testament church that was birthed out of Old Testament law. And that was fulfilled with Jesus Christ as the perfect sacrifice to where we don't have to make sacrifices. We don't have to follow the letter of the law. Now we live by faith in him. So this is all brand new. And you have some teachers and men that come from another area and they say, no, 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 hold on, hold on, guys, hold on. Wait. Time out. Grace and faith, that's all good and all. 
But what we need to do is we need to pair the law plus works plus grace, and then it's then it'll be okay. So we need to live by faith and follow Jesus, but we've got to revert back. You've got to be circumcised. You gotta follow the law. And you gotta adhere to what the prophets all said. So obviously Paul and Barnabas have issue with this. So they're going to talk to the apostles and they need to make a decision on what they're going to do. Is it going to be just faith and grace? Or is it going to be this mixture of law and faith and adherence and having to be circumcised and all of these other things that had been added to the law? Think about the cultural implications of this. What if the Judaizers had come down and had convinced everyone to do this? You and I would not be living out Christianity as we know it today. It would be this strange hybrid of Jewish tradition plus Christianity. Who knows what it, what it would look like? Think of the cultural implications today. A man gets, commits his heart to the Lord. He's 35. That's it. I committed my life to the Lord. I'm, I'm in. I'm there. No, not quite. Well, what else do I need to do? There's this small procedure that you have to have. No, thank you. I'm done. You know, I move on to the next this has cultural and severe implications. And so they're faced with this very difficult decision. The apostles must make a choice. They must determine the path that they're going to go. Not just the issue of circumcision itself, but the entire construct of what it means to be a child of God. Now, let me give you a side note here. The gospel always puts relationship first. Religion always puts rules first. Religion tells you that the gospel is not enough or the cross is not enough, but the gospel tells you that the cross is enough. Religion will tell you that, no, you, it, it's the cross, it's the Bible, but then you got to add stuff onto it. you got to add this and you got to add that, and then it'll look like it's supposed to look like and you'll be okay. But the gospel says that it's all about the cross. It's all about your heart. It's all about your relationship with God. And walking out a real journey with him. If you're in this place today, know this. If you have been troubled in your life with church and religion, Know this, it's not about a set of rules, it's about a relationship. We read the word of God not to, um, not to deduce a set of rules and regulations over our lives. We read the word of God so we can grow closer to God. And we can get more in tune with his heart. The creator of the universe... The all-creative, all-loving, all-powerful God. We have the opportunity to, on a daily basis, read his inspired and written word to grow closer to his heart and to hear his voice and to line up our lives with how he leads us. And he will lead you from glory to glory to glory. It's all about relationship. So then, in chapter 15, verses 29 through 20, it says this. Therefore, and this is James speaking, it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles, but that we write to them that they abstain from the things contaminated by idols, from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. This is the decision that they make. Now, 
we all know that not all decisions are created equal. In fact, we cannot guarantee the results of our choices. But there's one thing I can guarantee you, is that come tomorrow, you're going to make some more. You're going to be forced to make more choices. And the day after, you'll make some more. And the day after that, you'll make some more. I mean, come on guys, just walk into a Starbucks and you'll be forced to make 30 decisions within five minutes. Tall, half-calf, right? Venti, whatever. I mean, you got to make 20 decisions just to have a coffee. I can't guarantee you what your, the results are going to be. And that's the thing we need to understand. Faith is not about guaranteeing the best results. It's about giving us the tools to be able to make the best decisions that we can in any and every situation. Because you're going to come up with a, with a decision that you have to make. You're going to come against something, and most likely it'll be sometime soon. You're going to have a situation come across your path to where you don't know what to do. You won't know what the right decision is going to be, but you need to be equipped with the tools to get to that right decision. In this circumstance, this decision gives us a blueprint for how you and I can make the best decision in every situation. Let's read here a little further down. Acts 15, 26 through 29 says this. Men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, whom themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it, and now circle this, write this, uh, highlight it, underline it. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. You keep yourselves free from such things and you will do well. Farewell. Mind blown. One of the most critical decisions in all of New Testament history. And the apostles gather together to make this all important, world altering decision. And the best that they come up with seem good to God and seem good to us. That's it. I mean, there's no, lo, we, we laid low for 40 day and 40 night, thus beseeching the face of God. And the fire came down, and the hail came down, and the Lord split the earth open and gave us the answer. No. You see, sometimes we want that, though, don't we? I mean, we want that in life. God, just show me the way. Just show me. Just give me the answer. Just write it. In the tablet in the sky. And I will follow you. I remember being 16 and praying. God, if you could just, just in my mind, just show a picture of the girl I'm supposed to marry. When I meet her, whether it's five years or ten years, just let me know. What a ridiculous thing to pray. Because when we do that, we put our faith in the answers. God, if you show me all of the answers, I will obey you. But what we need to understand is if God gives us all the answers and lays it out for us, then, then we don't need him. We got the playbook. God, I don't need you. I don't need to trust in you. I could trust in your playbook. Because you've told me what I'm going to be doing in 5 and 10 and 15 years. That's not how it works. It's not a life plan, it's a relationship. 
That's why Jesus says to the disciples, follow me. Where are we going? Follow me. But where are we headed to? Follow me. Because I'm the destination. Get close to me. And I will give you the tools that you need to make the best decisions. So here are the tools that he gives us. Number one, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. When you go to make a decision, the first question you should always ask is, will this honor God? Will this honor God? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Now notice, they say it seemed good to the Holy Spirit first. They don't say it seemed good to us and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Because so often we want to tack on God's approval to the decision we've already made. Well, it's getting, we're getting real in here. We go ahead and make the decision in our heart and then we ask God to bless our busted decisions. I need you to bless this busted decision of mine, God. In fact, if you could fix it up just a little bit, put a little spackle and paint on it, because it's a busted decision. Stop making busted decisions and asking God to bless your busted decision. Start asking to honor God in the decision that you're about to make. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit first. So often in youth ministry, now I know this doesn't apply to adults because we're all sophisticated and Holy, and we love Jesus. But, and some of y'all that are in youth, or were in youth with me, you're going to chuckle at this. I always, you know, you always had some young, well-intentioned young lady starts dating Johnny Quarterback. You know? Johnny Quarterback don't love Jesus. He, in fact, Johnny Quarterback don't love anybody who's not Johnny Quarterback. And in fact, if you could love Johnny Quarterback half as much as Johnny Quarterback loves Johnny Quarterback, you'd be doing all right. He don't love Jesus. He don't want nothing to do. He don't, he don't respect his mama. He don't respect his daddy. But he looks good. And he can throw a football. And they get into a relationship with Johnny Quarterback. Johnny Quarterback doesn't love that girl. Johnny Quarterback loved Johnny Quarterback. And that girl is a means to an end. And then she asked the Lord to bless said relationship with Johnny Quarterback. Sweetie, you are 15 years old. You don't need to worry about anybody. Johnny quarterback, Johnny cornerback, Johnny offensive lineman, Johnny water boy. You don't need to worry about that. You need to worry about the Lord and your grades. When we get into this situation. See, now we we follow this down the road. See, see, here's the thing. Now, 20 some years ago, 30 some years ago. If even more poor choices were made, and this young lady is now left with a child from Johnny Quarterback, now they're forced to get, now they're married, forced to get married. Nowadays, that's, that's, that's not hardly even an option anymore. Now she's, now she's 15 years old raising a child by herself. And it all starts with a decision. You see, guys, we need to understand whether you're 15 or whether you're 50, you need to understand one thing. Sin will take you places that you never thought you would go in order to impress people that you never thought you would like doing things that you never thought you would do. But it starts with a decision. And the first question you should always ask yourself, whether it is a business venture, whether it is a relationship question, whether it is a question in your job, the question, first and foremost, you should ask yourself is, will this decision honor God or not? 
It seemed good to the Holy Spirit. The second tool that we see that will help us make decisions in every situation is this. You seek him. Number two, you seek help. It seemed good to us. You need to ask yourself, does this decision make sense? Is it logical? (laughs) And it's amazing how many of us as adults, we have a hard time answering that question. Because let's be honest, some of our decisions just don't make a whole lot of sense sometimes. Now probably you guys, y'all all make sense. But me, sometimes I make choices and I look back and I'm like, well that did not make sense at all. What was I thinking? I got overwhelmed with the options. Right? I don't know about y'all, but man, we have too many options nowadays in our world. If you don't think so, just go to Bucky's. A couple years ago, we went down to Galveston. Take my kids to Bucky's. They're going to love it. Why? Because the thing is two square miles. And you walk in. I mean, like, two days later, you're well, where's my children? They're running around like Lord of the Flies, you know. Got a stick and a loincloth, and they're just, I mean, they're just wild. Uh, you, war paint, I mean, just too many choices. Can't say, hey, go get a drink, because there's 15,000 drink cases. We get flooded with all these options. And so often our choices, they don't even make sense. We're just going from from urge to urge to urge. When you make choices in your life, you got to ask yourself, does this decision make sense? And listen, the verbiage that is used in Acts is very specific. He says, it seemed good to us. Circle us if you're taking notes. Because it doesn't say it seemed good to me. If you're the only person that your decision makes sense to, you need to rethink your decision. Faith is meant to be lived in community. It made sense to the Holy Spirit and it made sense to us. It was a good decision to us. I will tell you, we can avoid so many pitfalls and traps if we just incorporate a little extra common sense to our lives. You want to to have some fun? You ever heard that, that challenge where you put in your birth date and into a Google search and then add a Florida man in your birth date? Oh, that's fun, y'all. You know, people who don't have some common sense do that and just put in a Florida man and then your birth date. And people do some crazy things down there. It'll pull up all kinds of news articles of, you know, man wrestles alligator, gets his arm bit off, you know, stuff like that. You know, it's common sense. Incorporate a little common sense in your life. It'll do so much. Second Chronicles chapter 10 talks of a king named Rehoboam. He actually split the kingdom. The revolt happened under his rule. Because what Rehoboam did was he took advice from his father's advisors, the generation before him. He listened to them, but he didn't heed their advice. They said, you need to be kind to the people. And then he gets around his buddies, his his fraternity brothers. You know what I'm saying? Guys are just there for the good time. And he asks their opinion. And they said, no, nah, man, you need to be harder. You need to say, my father's waist was like my pinky. I'm going to be so hard on you guys, we're going to come down. He says, that's amazing. Let's do that. And he does that and splits the kingdom in two. Because he's not willing to take the advice of the generation that's gone before. Listen, God has placed people in your life that have gone before you and that are a generation before you so that you can heed their advice. Because listen, chances are the dumb mistake you're about to make, they've already made it. And they're trying to help you avoid that dumb mistake. You ever notice how your parents when you are a kid always knew 
the dumb stuff, you're, or the lie that you told, they knew it was a lie. Do you know why? Because chances are they told it themselves. They remember the lie. I remember telling that lie. It was a horrible lie. I'm catching you in that lie. And if you are of the older generation, I encourage you, find somebody and pour into them. Mentor them. That's what it's all about. Intergenerational growth. It seemed good to us together as a family. With stakes so high, these tools seem kind of flimsy, don't they? Seem good to the Holy Spirit, seem good to us. But here's the thing, guys, as I conclude. Sometimes that's all you have to go on. Sometimes you don't have it laid out there. Sometimes you don't have all the information. See, we want to make safe choices. We want to gather all the information and do cost comparisons and do, you know, everything in our life and have it laid out and then make the choice. But there are times in life where you don't have all the answers before you. You've got to be able to make the right choices in that situation. And God is telling you, telling me, telling us, that if, you would, if we would just stop and ask ourselves two questions. Number one, will this honor God? And number two, does it seem good? Is it logical to us? Seek Him and seek help. If we can get those two simple things down, it will put you so far ahead in your decision-making curve, it will be cr It's crazy. Because times, <clears throat> there are times in life where you just gotta, you just gotta trust and step. You've gotta trust and step. And maybe, maybe you lost your job. And you don't see the potential outcome. It's all right. Trust and step. Maybe your marriage is hanging on by a thread and you don't know what tomorrow will bring. You've got to trust and step. Trust and step. Maybe you have a family member who is in the hospital right now and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. Trust and step. Trust and step because God has given you and given I the tools to make the necessary decisions. Trust and step. Seek Him and seek help. And as we do this, as we follow the example of this group of rebels from 2,000 years ago, you and I will begin to make better decisions today to build a, a better tomorrow for ourselves. And all the results may not be guaranteed. You and I have the tools to make God-honoring choices that will lead to our best life, the life that He intended for us, the life that He's planned for us. If everybody would, go ahead and stand to your feet all across this place. We're going to bring the lights down just a little bit. If you would, bow your heads and close your eyes with me. For some of you in this place, the first choice, the choice you need to make right now is to, admit, to submit yourself to the Lord, to make Him the Lord of your life. Word of God says that we are a new creation in Him. There's somebody in here today, I believe, that God wants to make you a new creation to take all the old away and to give you a heart of flesh, to give you a new perspective, to give you a fresh start. Oh, doesn't that sound amazing? A fresh start. Free from the guilt of yesterday, free from the condemnation of past choices, a fresh start. That's what the Word of God says this happens. You get a fresh start and a fresh heart. Come on, somebody. If you're in this place, whether you want to commit or recommit your life to Jesus Christ with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you be brave enough to raise your hand so I could pray with you today? 
Pastor Mark, I want a fresh start and a fresh heart. Is there anybody in this place today? Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I see some hands going up. This is what we're going to do. I want to pray. I want you to pray with me. And church family, I want to, well, let's all pray this together because we're a family. Pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you sent your son Jesus to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, but to be risen again so that I can have a fresh start, so that I can have a fresh heart, and so that I can live with you in heaven. I pray that you would wipe the slate clean. I pray that you would forgive me of my sins. As I surrender my life to you, lead me from glory to glory to glory. Amen. All across this place, though, every head bow, every eye closed, is a personal moment. Some of you have decisions that you need to make. You have situations that have been thrust upon you in your life. And you're unsure what to do. If that's you in this place, would you raise your hand? You've got decisions. Maybe it's a family situation, a relationship situation, something at work, something at home. But you've got decisions. Oh, yeah, hands are going up. Hands are going up. Yeah, yeah. Know this. The Holy Spirit wants to lead and guide you. As you ask, as you seek Him and seek help, He's going to lead and guide you. Is there anybody else? I just feel that there's, I just feel there's a couple more people that just need to raise their hand. Okay. I want to pray over you today before we dismiss. I want to encourage you. This is one of those sermons that it is lived out not just here, but it, it's lived out on a Tuesday. It's lived out on a Thursday afternoon. God has given us the tools that we need to make the choices that will honor Him and lead us closer to Him. And although we may not see all the angles or have all the answers, we can trust and step, trust and step, knowing He's there every step of the way. Dear Father, we thank you so much today for your presence. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you that you lead and you guide us. I pray right now for those who have decisions that need to be made. I pray for those who are facing situations and obstacles with family members, on their jobs, situations that they don't have all the answers for. Lord, I pray that you would give them peace in the midst of that circumstance. And as these obstacles continue to come, and as choices are, must be made, I pray that you would give us the tools to follow the leading of your Holy Spirit. I pray that we would seek you first and foremost, asking ourselves, what honors you. And the Lord, I pray that we would seek help. Seek the voice of a godly friend. Seek the voice of somebody who maybe has gone around the block a few more times than us. A mentor. And as your word says, I pray that iron would sharpen iron. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your spirit in this place. And I know that we're going to leave this place empowered. We're going to leave this place energized. We're going to leave this place anointed to make better choices and build a better tomorrow for ourselves. As you lead us, a tomorrow that's closer to you than today, a tomorrow that's more anointed than today, a tomorrow that's more empowered than today. We thank you, Father. We rejoice we worship you. We praise you. And everybody in the house said, amen, amen, amen. God bless you today. The Lord is good. Amen. Have a great afternoon. We'll see you at small groups tonight. We'll see you Wednesday night at our meeting.
midweek service, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great week. God bless you.